born in the rivers these fish go out to sea, return years later to spawn, die in the river, and deposit their nutrients in the stream for the next generation. I think that the, the whole cycle of life in the Northwest was built on salmon migrating upland in great abundance. Salmon are the iconic species here in the Pacific Northwest from a cultural, social, economic, ecological perspective. It's an industry that keeps this community and all the communities along the coast alive. So I got here to this community, fell in love with the river, fell in love with the fish, and uh, fell in love with the people. As Indian people, we were taught um, by our elders that um, the Creator uh, gave us these gifts of food to keep us um, alive. But he made a deal with us. He said if we take care of these foods, these foods will take care of us. I don't know what it really is, but people love to fish. It's been a lifetime sport for me and a love and uh, fly fishing and I'm, and I'm not done, I'm still gonna keep going. They're a source of food, they're a source of recreation, and there is no downside to having salmon in these rivers. We're living in an altered ecosystem. That altered ecosystem impacts the number of salmon returning back to streams. I, I love the bumper sticker says we all live in salmon habitat. Uh, there's a false belief that people who live in the city uh, are not living in salmon habitat. And the truth of it is, we all from top to bottom are living where salmon live. There remain a host of limiting factors that impact salmon returns to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, hydroelectric development, just human population growth, a barrier from road crossings, mining development, timber harvest. The solution to that, we've got to continue to work on the habitat, we've got to deal with over harvest, we've got to deal with predation, but hatcheries also are part of that solution. Hatcheries are um, even more than a solution, they're a requirement. Uh, is it where we desire to be? No. Is it a necessity in a lot of cases? Yes. We started fishing the Olympic Peninsula streams almost 30 years ago. Um, they have the largest, some of the largest steelhead in the world live right here. On the Solduck itself, um, I believe that it's still a very healthy run. One of the reasons it is healthy is because of our Snyder Creek broodstock program that we've had on this river. Uh, the Snyder Creek program, we started in, in late 1984. It brought together a lot of individuals from uh, Port Angeles and Forks to um, donate their own time, uh, materials, equipment. They started seeing what they thought was a decline in the number of fish. And so they wanted to increase the number of fish and they thought the best way to do that was with a wild broodstock program. We use wild steelhead out of our sole duck system. As that run got stronger, you could see the, the number of fish in the upper river system dramatically change. Year after year, the runs uh, of Snyder fish kept getting better and better and the wild stock numbers have increased as well and now 25, 27 years later we're seeing the best runs of wild fish we've seen and like I said I've been here 40 years and it's as good as I've ever seen it. We really didn't think that they had ever squashed this 
program, but at the end of our 25 year lease. They just changed the sole duck into a wild steelhead gene bank, which means that it doesn't have any more hatchery production on it. The people that are opposing the Snyder Creek program, for the most part, are not from this area. So the community was very much in support of continuing the Snyder Creek program. Uh, there were other folks from outside the area, other interest groups that were basically the, the opposition to the Snyder Creek program going forward. What people didn't know, the numbers we had in, in the early 80s versus the numbers we have now, there's no comparison. We didn't have fish in December and January in the Salduck River. Part of the reasons that the um, facility was closed is uh, based on data that um, was tied into a system that was a tributary of the Columbia, the Hood River study. And that is not um, been a study that's been done here locally. And I just, I don't think they did their homework here. I'm Michael Bluen. My, uh, I'm a professor at Oregon State University in the Department of Integrative Biology. And I study genetics, population genetics. A large amount of data had been accumulating over time suggesting that old domesticated stocks of fish, which had been passed through hatcheries for many generations, were performing poorly in the wild relative to wild fish. And people had just observed this. Um, interest had started in using first generation hatchery fish, that is those created using two wild fish as brood stock, in replace of those old domesticated stocks. And the assumption was that these first generation hatchery fish would be just like wild fish because they were only one generation removed from the wild. So in the Hood River, there was a dam uh, in place from 1991 through uh, 2010 and every adult steelhead that was passed over the dam and initially had a scale sample taken from it. Starting in 2003, we also asked the uh, ODFW staff if they would collect a fin snip because we get even higher quality DNA out of a fin snip. So each of these vials contains a little snip off the dorsal fin and we get extremely high quality DNA out of these. And so basically what this has allowed us to do is uh, to get a DNA sample from over 20,000 fish that were passed over the dam during that 19 year period. So what we were able to do in the Hood River was we were actually able to look at the fitness of two older stocks as well as the fitness of a first generation stock of winter run steelhead. And the point estimates are quite variable from year to year, but averaged over six years of data, we see that on average, uh, first generation steelhead in the Hood River average about 85% the fitness of a wild fish. I'm Peter Galbraith. I'm a fishery scientist here with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. I do not question in any way the validity of the results from the study on Hood River Steelhead. I need to caution that we cannot extrapolate these results to all hatchery supplementation programs and especially to all hatchery fish. Programs differ, species differ, river systems differ. The Johnson Crick uh, project that the tribe is currently operating uh, was initiated um, back in 1998. We were down to five reds. Pretty scary situation. We wanted to get more fish out there. But at the same time, we didn't want to have a negative impact on that population that would affect the long-term productivity. Some refer to that as fitness. Um, in terms of how, how well that, that population would perform in the long term. Using it, uh, the natural origin fish from the get-go, uh, and then following that supplementation thought process, uh, we were able to look at the relative reproductive success of hatchery origin fish to their natural counterparts, uh, much like what was done in the Hood River study, but with a different starting point, a different stock, a different management uh, structure for those hatcheries. When we conducted the analysis in a similar way uh, done in, in the Hood River studies, uh, we found different results. Uh, we found that the relative reproductive success of those hatchery fish was not much different from the natural origin fish.
from a science standpoint and the community that I interact with most, um, I don't think there's that much contention. We see the Hood River study and the Johnson Crick study being two data points from a huge data gap and that we still need additional information. We didn't expect the results from these studies to all align. Um, sometimes there are folks that grab a hold of that science information um, when it fits or doesn't fit their particular management philosophy. As fishermen, we need to be very concerned about our legal future for our endeavor. We need to know that hatchery practices and other regulatory issues are being highly scrutinized by groups that have a very different political agenda and very different view of the natural world than most fishermen. Marmot Dam in the Sandy River never really became functional. It was, it was always subject to water withdrawals. It was always clogging up. And finally, through coordinated efforts and raw caring of individuals, Marmot Dam was slated for removal. There was this opportunity of a free-flowing river. But what's come from it is instead of hatchery fish being the fish that saved the Sandy River, now in the face of a free-flowing river, hatchery fish are being demonized as the actual cause of the Sandy River decline in the first place. As Portland was getting its roots, it relied upon the Sandy Basin for the raw materials. The Sandy's history is one of logging, of gravel extraction, of mining, of dam development, hydropower. People there keeping an eye on fish had difficulty given the sawdust and the splash dams going on in the Sandy River, even finding fish at that time. The Marmot Dam was built in 1928 uh, and it was completed and there was a ladder put in that very first year. Uh, but after the first high water, it washed the ladder away. You know, the river's characterized by a 13 year period where there was no passage of salmon and steelhead into the upper basin at all pretty well destroyed the entire Spring Chinook salmon run in the Sandy River because they had to reach those headwaters, the Salmon River, Zigzag River, and Steel Creek were the premier spawning areas for spring salmon on the Sandy. By the late 60s and early 70s, the Spring Chinook runs on the Sandy River were down to an average of 168 fish. What started at 168 fish was joined by hatchery fish in the 70s, was bolstered by out-of-basin clackamas fish in the 1980s. 20 years of intensive hatchery management followed. And at the end of those 20 years, what we know today on the Sandy is that we have 1,500 wild spring Chinook, the progeny of out-of-basin hatchery stocks. It's here where the Sandy grew its reputation for being a sport fishing capital of the state of Oregon. That wasn't a function of where we had started back in some previous decades. It was a function of the hatchery program. For groups that are intent on taking away hatchery fish from our systems, the legal system is a, a tool that they intend to use. For the residents, businesses, and communities surrounding the Sandy Basin, I think they're gonna have real difficulty swallowing the implications of recent legal actions that have taken place there. As we have so many examples of places where we're using a variety of methods to create excellent fishing opportunities and strong wild runs. From purely wild stocks when the limiting factors allow to supplementation programs utilizing native origin brood stock. There's even modern eyed egg planting technology that's hardly been utilized. And yes, even our old style domesticated hatchery fish, when used properly in watersheds or habitats that are incapable of supporting wild fish, can provide an ample opportunity and connect fishermen to the resource. The Lower Columbia Commercial Fishing is the oldest continuing 
uh, industry in the Pacific Northwest. The commercial fishery is a food supplier. They're farmers of the sea or the rivers. As we addressed, as society and the departments addressed how we, we deal with endangered species listing, we realized that the easiest thing to do was to restrict harvest. The community looked at that and realized that they were losing the infrastructure and the backbone of their, uh, of their economy. So we created net pens in a few of the off-channel areas, Young's Bay, Tongue Point in the lower river, and began to raise what were surplus fish from the other hatcheries in the region, knowing that they would be coming back to those locations off the main channel where commercial fishermen and sports fishermen could catch them without encountering the wild fish, the protected fish that were going on upriver. It was a stopgap effort and we had to do it in an environmentally responsible way and in a salmon responsible way. The Clatsop Fisheries Project has served its purpose providing additional fishing for a number of the local commercial fishermen while waiting to get back on the river. Harvest augmentation programs using domesticated stocks serve a very specific purpose and are only one tool available to support the region and our wild stocks. There are new systems available and we must use them to move ahead. Well, that's about nine or 10 inches deep and I've hit a flat rock, so I won't be going any further there. Uh, my name is Todd Jones. I'm the president of Red Zone. Uh, Red Zone is a, uh, a, a technology transfer company. We steal ideas from other industries and bring them to the fish culture industry. Working on the habitat uh, alone is a long time process, but there's already plenty of underutilized habitat in the Pacific Northwest that should be uh, maximized uh, with a, a low energy effort such as this. We plant about 200 to 300 eggs in each hole, and we can do about nine holes per square meter, so we're getting a 2,500 to 3,000 egg plant, which is considered low density. Now, eyed egg planting is not a new science. It's been done for decades throughout Idaho, Montana, uh, Washington, and a little bit in Oregon, but it's been so labor intensive and so un evaluated that it's assumed that it was not effective. We have data from out of Alaska that shows this is very effective. And so, you know, those are residual ideas that uh, A, is supplementation really valid? B, is this anything different than they did 30 or 40 years ago? It's completely different. Do we have a machine that works in, in, in Alaska and other places and it, it's a tried and true way of supplementing the stream? Absolutely. Do we have the ability to go in and, and uh, affect change by getting on the river to, to do that? We, yes, we can. The, the roadblocks are trying to find those individuals that make the policies to allow that to happen. So in a perfect world, yes, I would, I would use this style of supplementation to, to help increase those fish runs as soon as possible. So I, I think salmon are important. My name is Tim Juarez. I uh, live here in Tillamook and I've been a professional fishing guide for 24 years here on the North Coast. I love people, but mostly I love the bite. I love to watch people catch fish. Jack Smith, um, to, to give anybody the individual credit, I remember him out on the rivers when the water was high and he's out there by himself and I'm wondering what's this guy doing? Well, as I found out a um, short period of time later, he was out trying to capture wild steelhead to get this program started. On the Wilson River, uh, we had hatchery programs here that were, uh, science has since told us, were maybe not the best way to run a hatchery program. And so in 1997, uh, we started a program where we take wild fish from the river we uh, use those for broodstock so that every one of those hatchery smolts, their parents were wild. 
The fishery here on the Wilson has gotten to be longer because it's longer and there's more fish around to be caught. That increased opportunity has caused it to be more interesting to, uh, to folks. You know, those people are buying bait at the tackle store, they're buying shuttles at the tackle store, they're buying groceries, they're buying gas, they're staying in motels, they're eating at restaurants. That's one of the benefits of fishing is that it's something that affects rural communities the most because um, that's where it happens. If I ever saw anything really happen to the wild populations of fish on these broodstock rivers, I'd be one of the first guys to say no more because we need our wild fish. But I have not seen that difference in those rivers. So at this point, what we need to do is use the best science and, and uh, operate hatcheries in the most responsible way possible so that we can have fish, both wild and hatchery. Uh, I think there's a lot of synergy now across management entities to understand how well those best management principles are working and which parts of those can be replicated to other parts of the ecosystem, which parts don't work very well and need to be tweaked within the existing programs, and, and then uh, how, how much intensity has to be done across the landscape to understand that. In 1990, there were only 78 um, Snake River Falls Chinook that passed Lower Granite Dam. It was not too long after that that the Snake River Falls Chinook were listed under the Endangered Species Act. And then there were challenges to our tribal fishery that led us to a court case in United States versus Oregon. Out of that court case came a supplementation program that's using hatchery fish to restore naturally spawning fish. That program began in 1995, and since then the, the fish have responded dramatically in a way that no one would ever have expected. My name is Aaron Penny. I'm the acting complex manager for Nespers Tribal Hatchery. Nespers Tribal Hatchery is a supplementation hatchery where, where other conventional hatcheries raise fish for um, sport fishing and harvest, we raise fish to restore a lost resource. Uh, use natural origin fish, acclimate, release the, the smolts in proximity to the natural spawning areas where you want the adults to return. They migrate out through the hydro system back to the ocean where they rear in the ocean to adulthood. They mature at that point, they return to fresh water to recommence the cycle. We are taking delicate extra care with every single female that we handle to make sure that we get all the eggs because these are all the fish we have. From the first step of collecting the adults, holding them, to spawning, early rearing, to release, we take extra care in how we uh, raise our fish. We try to raise them to behave and act like wild fish. From less than 100 fish one year in the early 1990s to 56,000 in 2013 with 40,000 active spawners, it's pretty darn good. This last year we had over 55,000 fish come back over Lower Granite Dam. So the tribes have shown that we can do this right. We can make sure that we have uh, fish uh, coming back in areas that never saw them before, in greater numbers, with an abundance that supports fisheries throughout the basin and the ocean. Policymakers need to understand and demonstrate to the region where removal of hatchery fish has shown a positive response from these wild populations. We cannot continue to remove hatchery fish in the absence of all results. The way to fix fish abundance is to fix the issues that cause the decline, and hatchery fish are not the issue. There's a, a rationale for experimentation that hasn't captured the imagination of a lot of people yet. We've got the potential, we just need to manage it in a way that we all can enjoy it and have it here for years to come for our future generations. The question is, are we willing to do it and will the political and economic pressure allow us to do it because it is available? Our history in working with the uh, non-Indian sport commercial fishery hasn't necessarily been a pretty one. 
But one thing I can tell you with full confidence is that we're on the same side. All of us, we're all working together to bring the fish back. And it's not gonna happen if we don't work together. Working together, we will achieve success.